الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, in yesterday's class, we mentioned some of the ahadith uh, that we did not cover before concerning the Isra and the Mi'raj. And today I was hoping to carry on with uh, the series of events uh, in Mecca at that time. Uh, however, yesterday's class, there was a few brothers that asked specifically about uh, Riba. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about riba, backbiting, and we uh, some brothers asked to explain it uh, a little bit more in detail. So inshallah, uh, today's class will delve a little bit deeper into that uh, topic of riba. Uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about studying the seal of the Prophet wasallam, even though it is uh, history in the sense that one thing happened and then another thing after that happened and so on a progression of events but also every single event every single moment in the time in the lifetime of the Prophet وسلم, we derive lessons we derive benefits from that uh, so yesterday we mentioned the punishment of people who uh, backbite and the Prophet وسلم, saw these people uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for these people nails made out of uh, copper and they were uh, scratching their face uh, and that uh, the blood and the flesh was fall falling down um, and some brothers what they asked was well what constitutes riba? what is riba? and the Prophet Sallallahu uh, like we mentioned yesterday, he actually described riba backbiting to the companions. They asked him uh, about riba, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, it is to mention something about your brother that he does not like. Uh, and this goes the same for sisters as well. And the companions, they said, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what if what I'm saying is true what if what I'm t uh, saying about him is found in that person then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if that is the case then you've fallen into riba this is the actual definition of riba and if what you are saying is not true then you've fallen into a much graver sin a uh, uh, bigger a major sin and that is Bhutan, uh, uh, then you've fallen into Bhutan, you've lied about your brother in his absence. And the scholars in Islam, they bring our attention to the verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes those who fall into backbiting. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Meaning, do, do, do you love, do anyone from amongst you love to eat the flesh of your brother uh, whilst that person being deceased, dead? فَكَرِهْتُمُوا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers it uh, and says, you would have hated it. So the scholars in Islam, they say here, first of all, there's a mention of human flesh amongst almost all communities in the world, all societies around the world, eating human flesh is seen as something uh, repulsive, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, eating human flesh. Not only that, the example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives here is not anyone's flesh, it's not the flesh of your enemy, but it's the flesh of your brother, lahma akhi. This is someone that was close to you, someone that thought he or she was your friend. But instead of protecting their honor, 
you spoke bad about them in their absence. Not even bad, you might have mentioned certain things that they were not comfortable with you mentioning. And then on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Maytan, dead. This individual is like as if he's dead. Why is he dead? Because the scholars in Islam, they say, in the same way that dead people can't defend themselves. People who aren't present there can't defend themselves. You could lie, you can say whatever you want about the per person that is not there, and it is upon us as Muslims to defend the honor, the honor of our brothers and sisters. So, at the very least, if you happen to be in the company of people who practice this, who belittle these kind of things, don't think much of it, the very smallest uh, deed that you can do is to remove yourself from that. That you leave that person, you leave that gathering and you walk away. But the be that's not the best thing that you can do. The best thing that you can do is that you defend the person. You say, no, that brother or that sister is not like you said. I know good things about that person. And you try to mention good things about that individual. Uh, and one of the consequences, <coughs> sorry, one of the consequences of this evil deed is that on the day of judgment, when a person has uh, fallen into backbiting other people, they will have their good deeds taken away from them. They will have their good deeds taken away from them. So you might come on the day of judgment with a lot of good deeds, and you've fallen into this major sin of backbiting, talking about people. Then on the day of judgment, this person will come up to you and he will take some of your good deeds. And this is a true loss. Uh, so much so that the pious people before us, whenever they would hear about someone speaking bad about them in their absence, do you know what they used to do? They would actually go up to that person, some of these scholars, they would go to the person's house, knock on the door, and they would give the person a gift. And the person would be shocked. Why are you, why are you giving me a gift? And the scholar would say, this is in return for the hasanat that you have given me. You spoke about me behind my back. I don't have anything to reward you with. This is the gift and you've given me hasanat. But another thing that is important to mention is that riba, backbiting, often goes along with other sins. One of the major sins that backbiting goes along with is something known as namima. Namima means, in simple terms, a person who takes speech from one individual and takes it to another individual. He spreads uh, sometimes lies and sometimes he wants, he tells the truth, but his intention of telling the truth is to cause fitna, is to cause problem between people. And the Prophet sallallahu warned against these type of people to such an extent that he said that no naman, no one who's, who falls into this type of sin will enter Jannah. So this shows us how dangerous it is. Because sometimes people, they, they might not backbite, right? But they happen to be in the gathering. So they hear that these people are talking bad about someone. So what they do is, they take that speech and they go to someone else, or they go to that particular individual. And the reason why they pass on that information is not to help the person, they don't have the person's best interest at heart, they just want to create more problems. So they go to that person and they say, do you know what so and so said about you? You weren't there, but I was there. And I heard that they said this and that about you even though the person might be telling the truth. But that sort of action leads to more problems. And the scholars in Islam have said, this backbiting and this namima, when it becomes evident, when it becomes uh, common in a 
group of people in a society that is one of the signs of the destruction of that society. Meaning that if they don't change, if they don't do anything about it, it leads to a lot of facade, a lot of destruction. And the best example we have of that is mentioned to us in the Quran. The story of Aisha radiallahu anha. How people saw something. No one saw the actual crime that they accused her of. No individual. But they saw something and they added to that and they added to that. And the munafiqun, the hypocrites in Medina at that time, they took advantage of this. And they added fuel to the fire. But it wasn't only the munafiqun that fell into this uh, sin. It's a lot of good companions. Why did they fall into that sin? Because they didn't think twice. They didn't make sure to uh, verify the news. They heard something and they passed on that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those verses in Surah An-Nur, He urges these type of people to repent. Showing us that they did something wrong. Today, if you catch someone like that, the first thing the person will tell you is, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. I just heard information, I just passed it on. But that passing it on can have bad effects. So, in a very general way, these are the real dangers uh, that uh, backbiting uh, poses to a community. And those problems, those evils are not confined to the Akhirah, but also you see it in, the, uh, in this dunya. Today what I wanted to do is, because yesterday a lot of people asked about well, are there any exceptions? When is it allowed for a person to speak about someone else in their absence? And the scholars in Islam, they've agreed upon six different cases, scenarios where they say speaking about someone without them being present becomes halal. It does not become haram. And the first case is if, if there's dhulm involved. Okay, some kind of dhulm, someone has transgressed against someone else, taken their wealth, beaten them up, or whatever. They've done something to the person. Now, this injustice, if the person was to go to uh, the authorities and say, so and so did this to me, and that person isn't there, then no one can stop that individual and say, hang on, you're backbiting. No, this is not backbiting. Because someone has wronged you, and you're trying to get your right back. So in this case, if it's pertaining to Dhul, then the scholars in Islam, they said there's no problem in speaking honestly, truthfully about what happened. And you don't transgress yourself. If someone hits you, you mention that. But you don't go beyond that and start talking about other issues. This is important because people today, just because they don't like a particular action of a person, they speak about that particular action and they mention 10 years, 20 years before that. And they say, and also every time I see him, he has this look on his face. I don't like it. This is not allowed. Now you've gone beyond the boundary. The other point that the scholars in Islam mentioned is if 
a person is asking for a fatwa. What type of case? Let's say there's a problem amongst a husband and a wife. They go to the sheikh, they go to the imam, they go to someone that has knowledge in the matter. If the woman says, Sheikh, my husband does this and that, what is the Islamic ruling? Then that would not be considered to be riba. If the husband comes to the sheikh and he says, my wife, she does this and that, what is the Islamic ruling on this matter? then it does not become riba. But again, you have to stay within the, those limits. If you go beyond that and you mention things that are not necessary to mention, that will become riba. Another point uh, the scholars in Islam mention is, if you see evil being committed, People are committing evil. And you don't have the ability to stop that evil yourself. Then it becomes permissible for you to go to someone that has the ability to help you. And you tell that person, I've seen these people or I've seen this type of activity happening. Let's go and do something about it. By you telling them, does not mean that you're falling into the backbiting. So this, the scholars in Islam, they say it is isti'ana. If you see something that is munkal, that is evil, and you ask for help in order to get rid of that evil, it becomes permissible. Another point that the scholars in Islam mention is, if you hear about a threat. Someone poses a threat and you warn people against that threat. It can be someone that is spreading innovation, opening, or a person that is known to uh, do evil acts. Even if you don't have the ability to stop that person and you do tahdeer and you warn people against this person, then it does not become ghiba, it does not become backbiting. So this you see, often scholars, they see people who are misguided. They might worship graves, they might do a lot of you know, things that are contradictory to Islam. It goes against Islam. If a scholar, based upon knowledge, warns against these people and say, because of these practices, stay away from these individuals, no one amongst the Muslims can say the scholar is backbiting people. No. This is nasiha. This is giving advice and the Prophet وسلم, said that the nasiha is for the Amatul Muslimin, for all the Muslims. So if you see someone doing something that they shouldn't be doing, that that type of harm will spread in the community, then as a Muslim, not only do you have a right, but you have a responsibility to do something about it. Let me give you another example. If a person, if you catch a person sinning, and notice that I said you catch the person sinning, because in Islam you are not allowed to follow and investigate without reason. It is actually haram. Meaning that just because you think something bad about the person, doesn't give you the right to eavesdrop, to listen to their conversations, to take their phone and go through their messages and say, aha, this is what I thought, the person is up to no good. Or go through their computer and say, the person was up to no good. This is not allowed in Islam. But let's say 
you happen to come across the person. Now, if this evil is something that affects the community, then you can warn against that person. But if it's something that the person is struggling with on a personal level, let's say you catch, you're a young person, you see one of your, one of your friends with, walking with their girlfriend or boyfriend. Now, in this situation, it does not necessitate that you expose the person, that you tell every single person in the community and say, this person is doing this. No, there's better ways. And the best way is to take the person to the side, try to explain to them why it is harm. Because Islam is not about exposing people. Everyone has sins, but the point is to try to help the person become the best Muslim that they possibly can be. And this is important. In the same way, the scholars in Islam, they say the other point when riba does not become riba is if a person is open about their sins, if the person is open, they brag about it. And we see it today on social media. People, they take pictures holding, you know, alcoholic bottles, smoking, weed and drugs and so on, in public. Then in that case, Based on those circumstances, if you warn against a person, then it doesn't become a sin. This is important. And just as a reminder to all of us, when we, when a person sins, the Prophet وسلم, he said that every human being will sin. And the best of sinners are those who repent. However, there's a difference between the one that tries to hide their sin and they feel bad about it and they repent and they do good. And the one that doesn't care and makes it public. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that all of my ummah will be forgiven their sins except for the mujahideen, those who expose themselves and the scholars they said it is like the person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covered in the darkness of the night usually just as a general statement a lot of sin happens during the night because there's darkness there's you know people are sleeping and usually the people that are awake at that time a lot of them are not up to much good. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sheltered you. He hid your sins. No one else knows about your sins. Just you and Allah. And instead of you repenting and returning back to Allah and asking Allah for forgiveness, the next morning what you do is you boast about it. You go to people and you say, do you know what I did last night? I did so and so. For many of us, this type of speech, it sounds strange. Why would someone do something like that? But for a lot of young people, they might fall into this type of sin without even realizing. Again, you go on Twitter and you mention how amazing the party was last night and you mention the details and you mention and you mention this becomes the same as the person who boasts and exposes himself even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was hiding your faults 
And that leads us to the last point. And this last point is scholars in Islam have said it is a ta'rif. Meaning, if you fail to be able to mention or identify a person in a way that other people will recognize him, let's say there's a lot of Muhammads, and they are, or a lot of Abdullahs. Now, you can mention in those cases something about the person's appearance or behavior or something like that and this is mentioned about concerning the, the pious people before us the Salaf al Salih <coughs> some of them were known by these names the blind one the one that was limping and the scholars in Islam they say that this does not mean that uh, people are backbiting them when they say this but it is what they became known and it became uh, a lover for them. But it is best to avoid it as much as possible and this should only be used in circumstances which it, when it becomes very difficult to distinguish one person from another person. So for example if someone says uh, Brother Muhammad or Brother Ismail which one are you talking about? And a person wants to say the tall brother, the skinny brother, the black brother, the white brother, then this would not be sinful. So these are the uh, exceptions that the scholars in Islam mention when it comes to riba. Just because something is an exception doesn't mean that a person should fall into it and use it all the time but you should be very careful sometimes it can be applied sometimes you might go beyond that so a person needs to uh, be mindful of that so inshallah what we'll do is we'll conclude today's class uh, again today's class was just about clarifying this topic of riba and inshallah we will carry on uh, next week and Next week what we'll do is uh, we will uh, finish the Sila. Next weekend, inshallah ta'ala, will be the end of the Sila and uh, we will stop at the Hijra of the Prophet And after that we will have uh, other programs that are upcoming inshallah and uh, one in the future, when we get back to the Seerah, we will carry on from the Marhalatul Madani uh, and carry on until the death of the Prophet So right now, we covered uh, from the beginning of the, uh, the life of the Prophet and next week, we will conclude 